We would like to introduce tonight's guest, Dr. Michelle Thaller. Oh, great. Uh, uh, oh, great. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Did you want to switch places a little closer to my laptop? Oh, sure. I'll just do that, do a little do -si do here. Hi, everybody. It's <laughs> wonderful to be back. I, the, you, you can usually tell if I'm in Southern California, something's going on at JPL. <laughs> and uh, so there indeed is something big going on at JPL on Monday, 4th of July. Are you ready? We are about to go into orbit around Jupiter. Yay! 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 Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a long time since we've, we've had a Jupiter orbiter. And, uh, you know, I mean, so, so Jupiter, I mean, I mean, come on. I mean, the whole solar system, if it isn't about the sun, it's about Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> Jupiter has uh, the, the mass of all the other planets combined. I think, I think it's actually twice the mass of all the other planets combined. And um, it basically sucked up most of the solar nebula, the, the, the disk of dust and gas that formed the planets. So in some ways, Jupiter is this wonderful record of the formation of the solar system. I mean, just some, just some basic stats, right? So it's, um, it's about 1,000 times the volume of the Earth. You can fit 1,000 Earths inside. You can fit about 12 Earths across the diameter. It's uh, about three, a little more than 300 times the mass of the Earth. Uh, it goes around in about a 12-year orbit. It's about five times farther away than the sun, from the sun than the Earth is. And uh, one of the amazing things about Jupiter is that this whole giant planet actually rotates around about once every nine hours. So it's a very, very fast rotating big ball of gas. And um, the interior is, is very mysterious. That's one of the things we're gonna be studying with this ne next mission. So you know, what's gonna happen on Monday? Okay, so I'm gonna show you a bit of a movie about what's gonna happen on Monday. And quite frankly, this movie scares me to death. So <laughs> after, after this is done, here we go, here's the movie. The scariest thing to me about Juno are the unknowns. So much about the environment that we'll have to withstand is unknown. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. It's a monster. It's unforgiving. It's relentless. It's spinning around so fast, it's gravity. It's like a giant slingshot, slinging rocks, dust, electrons, whole comets. Anything that gets close to it becomes its weapon. And it just so happens, deep inside this body are the secrets we're after. Secrets about our early solar system. biggest and baddest planet in the solar system and it's got the biggest and baddest radiation and the biggest and baddest magnetic field. The background radiation that we're exposed to on Earth is about a third of a rad. What we expect to see at Jupiter is about 20 million rad. No spacecraft has ever flown this close to Jupiter, flown this deep into the radiation belts. So the real trick is, we're gonna go in close, get the data, and get out. And the first time we go in, that's the most dangerous. We call it Jupiter Orbit Insertion. J-O-I. Nothing's really certain about what's going to happen. Okay, hopefully that scared you too. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I think that the people at NASA, I think, have often been, you know, they've been accused of being a little bit too dry. You know, scientists are kind of showing you graphs and all of that. So they went a little over the deep end on this one. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you got to love it. I mean, it's, it, it actually, it's going to be a very, very dramatic day as we enter orbit around Jupiter. Uh, the spacecraft will be going at 160,000 miles an hour relative to Jupiter as it dives in. And so that's gonna be very unprecedented. It's the fastest a spacecraft has ever gone into orbit. There's a lot of firsts for this. I thought I would take a little time just to back up and talk a bit about the exploration of Jupiter and some of the things we're gonna to try to find out with this next mission. So uh, this is actually a picture taken by the Galileo spacecraft. The best images of Jupiter are still from the late 70s, right, Voyager. And uh, you know, there's a, a shot from Voyager 1 of the Great Red Spot. Uh, this is a hurricane that's persisted for as long as we've had telescopes. We don't, we don't actually know how old this thing is because as soon as we had telescopes powerful enough to see it, we saw this thing. Uh, it's about three times the size of the Earth. 
and uh, the wind speeds in there are usually between three and 400 miles an hour. It's actually a giant high pressure system, so it's different from a hurricane. It's, it's sort of a, a really interesting atmospheric anomaly. And uh, th th these are such beautiful images from Voyager. I mean, you've got to really stop and, and, and remember, this is not a computer-generated image. This is a, a real picture that we took of the red spot of Jupiter. Uh, Galileo launched actually in uh, 19, uh, 1998. And uh, it uh, was a, a mission that was managed here at JPL. It was actually a shuttle payload. So there it is going off uh, from the shuttle. Uh, it, uh, it, it famously had a problem with its large antenna. The large antenna did not open fully. And so while the mission actually worked really, really well, we didn't get as much data back as we'd hoped because we had to use the backup antenna, which had a much slower data rate. And uh, it still did amazing things. Uh, the, the Galileo spacecraft was in a much wider orbit. It went much farther away from Jupiter. And one of the main science goals was to look at the moons. Because of course, you know, the moons of Jupiter are a solar system unto themselves. And uh, some of these moons are gigantic. You know, Ganymede, the largest moon, is very nearly the size of Mars. So you know, these are really interesting bodies. This is the moon Io, the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Those are all active volcanoes just exploding. Every time we go by Io, we see two to 300 volcanoes erupting. And uh, the, the pictures that it took, I mean, these are images. That's, that's the real color. That's sulfur that was blasted out of the volcanoes. And that's an active lava lake uh, on a moon of Jupiter. You know, I, I think sometimes you do sort of need to step back and say, we, we've seen some pretty amazing things. And then, of course, there was Europa. And uh, you know, Europa is the subject of the, the next big foray we hope that NASA's <laughs> doing. Uh, this is a moon that has a, a huge liquid water ocean, uh, far more liquid water than the entire Earth underneath uh, an icy shell. And with the images that Galileo took, we were able to see areas in the ice where there appear to be maybe something like a hot spring underneath, something welling up. Uh, there are areas that we believe are actually venting water vapor, so there may be cracks that we can sort of access the ocean down. So the Galileo images were wonderful, and the, uh, the magnetic me measurements, the magnetometer that Gal Galileo had, really guarantees that there is, a, is that huge liquid water ocean. There's really no other way to interpret the data. So it's not that we think there's all this liquid water under the ice of Europa. We, we know it's there. And uh, we mentioned Ganymede. Uh, this was an image taken by Galileo of uh, the largest moon of Jupiter, the largest moon in the solar system, like I said roughly the size of Mars. Uh, Ganymede is also the only moon to have a substantial magnetosphere of its own. It has a, a really wonderful big magnetic field that Galileo measured. And this turned out to be really cool because it turns out that that magnetic field generates northern and southern lights, auroras. Uh, Jupiter's own radiation and, and own magnetic interaction actually generates these northern lights on, on uh, Ganymede. This is an artist's conception. But the Hubble Space Telescope observed those northern and southern lights over a period of some years. And this is a, a Hubble image. It's actually a composite image. There's a, an image of Ganymede, I think, from Galileo, and then they're showing you the Hubble observations on top. But by really very carefully watching how those auroras behaved over time, we realized there was a huge amount of conducting liquid underneath the ice. And that had to be salt water. And uh, we believe that there are oceans 60 miles deep under the surface of uh, Ganymede. And that blows away the record for the most amount of liquid water in the solar system. So uh, how do you find the, the biggest ocean in the solar system? You look at the northern lights. It's pretty cool. Um, Galileo also dropped a probe into Jupiter. We're going to talk to this, uh, talk a little, a little more about this later because this probe basically screwed up everything we wanted to know about Jupiter. Um, it, it took measurements of the gases as it, as it was falling in, and, and nothing was what we expected. And nothing matched other observations taken by Voyager and also from, from things like the shoemaker Levy 9 impacts that blew bits of Jupiter away. We were able to see sort of what the interior was like. The probe gave very, very anomalous readings. And partially we're back to figure out if that probe was right or if, if we really, either the probe was wrong or we really do not understand how planets form at all. So there's, there's some big questions to answer. Well, let's see, which, which are we hoping Oh, for? yeah, well, you've got the oceans on Pluto, right? It's like, who, you know, who, who ordered that? I have no idea. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's kind of fun. The, 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 the most recent great observations of Jupiter have come uh, just sort of happenstance. We use Jupiter as a way to slingshot things to the outer solar system, to give them a gravity assist. And this one was taken by Cassini. Uh, when Cassini went out towards Saturn, it's a beautiful image of Jupiter, and that's Io. And the little blue that you see there is actually some northern lights on Io. So there's a little bit of a magnetic interaction there. And this one was taken by New Horizons. Uh, when, when New Horizons flung by Jupiter to get out to Pluto, it took this beautiful high-resolution image of some of the cloud tops. So we've also had really amazing observations of Jupiter from Hubble. Uh, this is a Hubble image. 
and it's a composite image. There's the, there's the visible light cameras, and then there's an ultraviolet sensitive uh, camera on Hubble, which is looking at the northern and southern lights, the auroras. And think about how huge those auroras are when you think about you know, 12 Earths right, going across the diameter of Jupiter. Those are absolutely gigantic high energy auroras. And uh, this was one, an image that was released two days ago by Hubble. And uh, this, this was a wonderful thing that I actually you know, worked on a lot myself, is trying to get Hubble to support the, the, the Juno arrival. And so uh, Hubble is observing the auroras and the clouds of Juno as we go in uh, for our orbit insertion. Juno is going to be the first orbiter ever to do a polar orbit around Jupiter. We're going to be able to see the entire planet as the planet turns below us. And we're going to get an amazing view of these northern and southern lights. The, uh, the auroras are more interesting than you'd think because Jupiter generates this hugely powerful magnetic and electric field. And there are vast, basically, columns of flux, columns of electric current that connect Jupiter to its moons. And in the northern and southern lights, you see these things that are called footprints, where these magnetic interactions actually sort of smack into the atmosphere of Jupiter. And you get these high energy particles produced where these two magnetic fields interact. So uh, you can see the, the footprints that actually follow around the different moons in the auroras. And uh, yeah, actually, so, so in, in fact, yesterday they also released this lovely video. Uh, this is a video of the, the Hubble Space Telescope observations. And uh, that's the, those are the auroras of Jupiter, sort of shimmering. And you see the footprints of some of the moons coming around. So we're going to get a you know, really wonderful view of these auroras, hopefully for the next two years, that'll tell us a lot about the magnetic properties of the planet. OK, so what's happening? Juno, yay. Um, so with an entire suite of, of, of high energy instruments uh, for particles, uh, things for the auroras, we have a microwave radiometer that's going to be able to look into the clouds to uh, a pressure. You know, the, the air pressure here in this room is about one bar. That's the atmospheric pressure at the sea level of Earth. We're going to be able to look down to a pressure of 1,000 bars. So that's a depth of about 500 miles into the clouds of Jupiter. Uh, we've never seen that far into the planet before. Uh, we have a magnetometer to measure the magnetic field. And it's interesting. We're, we're going to try to figure out what the interior is like by being very clever also with just looking at the signals that the spacecraft is generating as it actually goes around. I'll talk more about that. So there's our, our instrument. You, you can see the scale of the spacecraft. Uh, it's fairly large. The solar panels are about 30 feet across Ooh. each of those arms. So it's a, it's a pretty big thing. Uh, here's it being constructed. The solar panels are folded up. Uh, you see the high gain antenna, which is the disk at the very front. Uh, the, uh, the radiation environment around Jupiter is incredibly toxic. Uh, I mean, there's so much radiation because there's a whopping big magnetic field. And when you have a huge magnetic field that spins around with a planet every nine hours, you're basically living in a particle accelerator. So uh, we had to somehow shield our instruments from that. And at the very top, this hasn't actually been done before. It's, it's kind of brutal, but I guess it works. We put them all in a titanium vault. So there's a 400-pound titanium vault with the instruments inside. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way we can think of to actually survive in this environment for the next two and a half years. Here's a picture of the solar panels being deployed. This is the, the, the farthest you've, we've ever used solar power in the solar system. The sun's not very bright out by Jupiter. And uh, when, when this mission was actually being designed, it was illegal for a small amount of time to use plutonium batteries. And th there was a really bad, there was a, a, a gap in their supply. So they actually said nobody can use uh, plutonium batteries. Now we have a few more, so we're doing OK. There's plutonium batteries on Curiosity. But uh, when this mission was being designed, we thought we had to do with solar. And, and so we are. The, the, the amazing solar panels are just, I, I think they're actually going to drive technology. It's one of these mm -hmm. NASA spin-offs. When you can make solar panels that efficient, uh, there may be something that we get out of this that's very interesting. We also have three uh, people along for the ride. They're Le Lego minifigures. Um, and uh, the, this is real. They are made of, 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 of spacecraft-grade aluminum. And uh, they're, they're on there. There's a partnership with Lego. The, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the figures uh, represent, in the, in, the, uh, in the upper left-hand side is Jupiter, king of the gods, with his lightning bolts. Uh, in the middle, there's Juno, Jupiter's wife, who we're sending out to keep an eye on him. <laughs> and uh, you know, all, all of the moons of Jupiter are named after the lovers of Jupiter. So that now we're sending out the wife. Uh, so she's got a, a magnifying glass to observe Jupiter. And, uh, and then the last one is, is Galileo, of course, who famously saw the moons of Jupiter. And there's a, um, there's a quote on the plaque, which is Galileo's log entry, when he first saw the moons of Jupiter and realized that they were spinning around the planet. So about five years ago, in two <laughs> 2011, there's the launch on an Atlas V. 
And uh, Juno has been careening around the solar system for the last five years. It's approaching Jupiter very quickly right now. And uh, as I mentioned, I mean, Jupiter is a real mystery to us because you can't see down into the clouds very much at all. And we believe that it's actually, the, the word gas giant always seemed kind of misleading to me because it's not all gas. Uh, only about, you know, about a quarter of the way down you get to liquid hydrogen. You know, Jupiter is mainly composed of hydrogen and helium like the sun. And then as you get further down and the temperature goes up and the density increases, you get a state of hydrogen called liquid metallic hydrogen that you actually compress hydrogen so much that, that the, uh, the, uh, the, it forms metallic bonds. It actually would be shiny looking like a metal. And all of this liquid metal generates a giant magnetic field. So that's the source of the huge magnetic field of, of Jupiter. Now, does it have a little rocky core? Is there a core, a planet in there, that maybe would be 10 times the size of the Earth? Could it be 20 times the size of the Earth? We've never gotten a good constraint on how big the core would be. And the reason we're going to be able to do it with Juno is we are going so close. We're actually going to be, closest approach is usually about 2,600 miles above the cloud tops every orbit. And that is so close to Jupiter that the gravity is actually different. The acceleration of gravity is slightly different depending on the density of the core. So we're going to be able to determine the density of the core just from seeing how fast the spacecraft plunges in and tiny little variations in the acceleration. It looks like part of Jupiter has um, left the rest oh, of the Oh, it's Jovian terrible. Union. <laughs> that's right. It's, it's sort of like the Brexit, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. The, so that's right. Like, I'm getting out of here, right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. So yeah, there's a, there's a depiction of the magnetic field. So our orbit, I mean, sort of like the overly dramatic video said, we, the, the idea is to plunge in time after time again and then get the hell out of there so you can possibly survive for two years. And so uh, that's kind of a nice cartoon version of it. Uh, this is a, the slightly more technical one. Um, so what happens on Monday is we fire the main engine to actually slow down and drop ourselves into orbit around Jupiter. At and, what time? Uh, it's, it's, I believe it's about 7.30 p.m. Eight. Thank you. You, no, thank you. I, I, you know, they, they just tell me where to talk, so I'm glad somebody knows. 818 tomorrow is, is when it will actually enter orbit around Jupiter. And um, we are actually going to go into two orbits that are about 53-day about orbits, and then we're going to make another maneuver to go into our science orbit, which is a 14-day orbit around Jupiter. And we will continue to do that, we hope, for about 36 orbits, which will take us uh, a little more than, uh, than two years to do. And uh, you actually can follow along with this. Uh, unfortunately, the, all of the instruments are being turned off for safety as we actually go into our first pass of Jupiter. So there will not be any images being returned immediately. Uh, however, what you can do is there's a really great website called eyes.nasa.gov. And you can follow along in real time. You'll, you'll see a computer-generated image, but that image will be entirely correct. That will be the orientation of the spacecraft, where the spacecraft is around Jupiter. It'll tell you information like the speed, you know, all of that. And uh, one of the fun things you can also do is go to the website and see what is actually downloading data in real time. So on the website, you can actually see these little depictions of different radio antennas all around the world, and you can see which missions are downloading. And so you can actually see the data coming back from Juno through this. Um, for those of you that have actually been to JPL, this is one of my favorite things about JPL. They, they actually do this in a more dramatic way. Um, this is a, a sculpture done by our artist in residence, and it's called the, the, the Pulse of Exploration. And these are, are lucite tubes with little LEDs in them. It's, it's, it's nothing all that high tech. But we actually have this linked into the actual uplink and downlink to all of our missions. So you'll see here that when, when, you, when you begin to see the lights, there's for scale. That's the artist, by the way. That's Dan Goods. Um, that's an uplink that he's filming. We're actually giving a command to a spacecraft somewhere in the solar system. And when the data is coming down, you see it kind of showering down. And, you know, being a scientist, this is just, a, I love to stand in front of this and just think about all the different missions we're sending commands up to and we're getting data down from. So, so there, we're still communicating with Voyager. So what you're going to see now is you're going to see an, uh, data coming in from Voyager. So that, that actually is real time that's really linked to when the data comes in. <laughs> nice slow rate there. I, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I love it. If you're at JPL, definitely go see it. So uh, th this was actually a screen grab I got from Eyes on Juno just a couple days ago. You know, we're, we're, we're about to come in. Uh, so follow along on the website. I think that'll be a lot of fun. And uh, Jupiter will also be visible in the sky. So I, although it's not actually, you know, particularly dramatic to see it from this distance, I like looking up and just thinking, you know, right now this is actually going around Jupiter. 
Now, there, there's a lot of really <laughs> cool questions we hope to answer. And um, I mentioned the probe that actually went into Jupiter as part of the Galileo mission. Jupiter is interesting. It's almost the same chemical composition as the sun, but it's enriched in heavy elements. It has more of all of the stuff that we're made of, the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen. And we figured that was probably due to lots of planetismals actually colliding into Jupiter. And we now think there's evidence that Jupiter really sucked up most of the solar nebula. In fact, it probably came in as far as where the orbit of Mars is. And it actually went back out. It's called the Grand Tack Hypothesis. And it's relatively new. But we realized that when there was still a thick disk of dust and gas around the sun, when the planets were just forming, that disk actually slowed Jupiter down. It interacted with Jupiter. And Jupiter kind of fell in towards the inner solar system. It probably, as it did so, destroyed any other planets that had formed at that point. So, I mean, we are probably a second generation solar system once Jupiter calmed down. And, uh, and then as Saturn and Neptune and, and the outer planets formed, they got into gravitational resonances that, that, that gradually kicked Jupiter back out. So Jupiter has some really interesting similarities to the sun, but really interesting differences too. But strangely enough, one of the, uh, the molecules that seems to be missing in Jupiter is oxygen. And when, uh, when the probe from Galileo went in, there seemed to be almost no water, very, very depleted in water. So if a lot of planetismals hit Jupiter, there should be a lot of water. So now we're thinking that we had really, really bad luck, that when the probe went into Jupiter, it went into like the Sahara Desert of Jupiter, a really dry spot. So I mean, it's sort of like you know, if you sample Earth and you only can go to one place, and you go to the Sahara Desert, you get a very bad view of what the entire planet's like. So there's mysteries about how Jupiter formed its interior and why its composition is different. And that's what we're after. I mean, we're after the, the, the clues about how the entire solar system formed, and Jupiter may be the key to that. So just wrapping up, um, there's another way you can participate in this mission. That's kind of fun. There's a high-resolution camera called GenoCam. And GenoCam was literally slapped on at the last minute because somebody realized we were going all the way to Jupiter and nobody put a camera on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, this, the, the, this mission, I mean, being, being a spectroscopist, this, yeah. the, the, this mission is what we call a squiggly line mission. Yeah, there's, it's going to be returning all these measurements that are basically graphs and squiggly lines, and you'll watch all the scientists going, ah, oh, wow. <laughs> but the, the general public, I mean, that leaves you a little bit cold. So they, uh, they decided to put a, res a fairly me you know, medium to high resolution camera on. And its main purpose is public engagement. It's not really part of the main science goals of Juno. Uh, this was an image taken by the camera of the Earth when it did a flyby of Earth. And so we know the camera's working. We know it takes pretty good images. And uh, since we're only going to be flying about 2,600 miles above the cloud tops, we will be right up against the clouds. This is, these will be the highest resolution images ever taken of Jupiter. Uh, going in, we did take a, a little image before we shut the camera off. Uh, so this is on the 21st of June. Uh, there you see a, a tiny little Jupiter, just, just not many pixels across. And you'll notice those four little dots. And uh, that was when we were still 11 million kilometers out from Jupiter. Uh, just so you know, those are indeed the moons. We know what they are. So uh, those are the moons as we were coming in. I believe on Monday, and this is something that I, I, we don't know for sure because it depends on what actually got processed, we'll have a movie of the moons actually going around as we fly into Jupiter. And I, I, there may also be an image of Ganymede coming fairly quickly. So a little bit of, of managing expectations. It's going to be a really dramatic day on Monday, but we're not going to get any images back. And if, if you want, this is my last slide before we can go to some questions, but if you want to know when images are coming back, um, what really starts happening is in, in later summer and early fall, uh, we should have our first images of the pole sometime in late August, a picture of Ganymede, like I mentioned. And, uh, and then come September and October, we're going to start automating the posting of the images. The public can see the raw images as they come in. And uh, hopefully we'll have a movie in October of, an, of a complete 14-day orbit of approaching Jupiter, diving into Jupiter, getting the hell back out, you know, and all of that. And, uh, and then in early November, we actually, this is kind of fun. In mid-November, because this camera is really meant to help the public get more involved in the mission, we're going to have voting campaigns for where you want us to look. So we're going to show you different places in the clouds that we thought were interesting. And then for, on, the, on the Juno website, you can vote on which ones you want the camera to go back and take a look at. So just to be clear, the first sort of Jupiter cloud top images when? <clears throat> I would say probably sometime in, I mean, the high resolution ones are going to be in the fall. Yeah. I mean, the, the, we'll have something in late August. I'm, I'm waiting to see. Great. Yeah. So you're going to limit the public's choices, though, right? Because <laughs> right. otherwise we'll end up with, like, Bodie McBoatface images. Bodie McBoatface images. <laughs> Which I was all for, but...
Right. Spotty McRedface. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. NASA was announcing that it did detect the magnetic field. Of yeah, Jupiter. absolutely. Yeah. Not only did it detect the magnetic field, so so I, I was on Science Friday today, and they actually played the, the radio uh, show. Mm. So we, we entered what was called the magnetopause. The solar wind actually shocks, makes a bow shock. The solar wind is, you know, million mile an hour particles. And when it hits the magnetic field of Jupiter, it, it, there's a bow shock. And so the, the Juno spacecraft passed through that. And the radio waves generated where it was, I mean, it kind of sounded like the black holes. It was kind of like, mm. woo, you know, sort of one, just, just a neat little radio thing. But uh, um, unfortunately, Ira Flato didn't ask me any details about the mission. Mm. So I, I'd memorized all these numbers last night because I was going to be talking to Ira Flato. And he's like, oh, Jupiter's a big planet. That's it. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, lo I, lo I love Ira. I, I'm a huge, I, I have to say, I was a bit starstruck. I wanted to be on Science Friday all my life. So I was on Science Friday today. Yes, yes. So that was really fun. Yeah. But, so, so that's, that's my primer on Juno.